So welcome back to the Visibility Show. Um, I am here interviewing Finn. Um, so Finn, I just want to thank you for taking time to um, be interviewed. Uh, I'm very excited to sit down and just have a chat with you and just to learn some more and to get uh, some information and education from you. Um, so why don't you start us off with just a little introduction um, about you, uh, your journey, your pronouns, um, and we'll start off with that. Sure. Uh, so my name is Finn. I am 30 years old. I live in Southern Maryland, and I am a transmasculine non-binary individual, meaning my preferred pronouns are they, them. Um, and all that basically means is that my gender expression leans more on the masculine side, but I still don't associate directly with either of the two sides of the gender binary. Um, and just to kind of clarify, because I know um, we are educating everyone, um, is that specifically what trans means? Um, does, it, does trans mean that you're kind of uh, floating between the two uh, more traditional genders? So transgender basically, like transgender has sort of evolved as a term over the years. When people think of transgender, they often think of, you know, okay, someone was born in a male body, but they want to be a female. And that's not always the case. Basically what transgender means is it's someone who transcends traditional gender roles. So you have two different types of transgender people. The people you typically think of when you think of transgender are what are called binary transgender people. So that's someone who was born in the body of a female, for example, but wants to transition fully to live and express themselves as male. Um, so those are binary transgender people. But then you also have non-binary transgender people, which are people who, you know, still don't identify with the gender that matches their sex organs, but they don't quite identify with either of either of the ends of the binary spectrum, if that makes sense. So all transgender means is your body and your brain don't quite match. Now, the degree to which they don't match will depend on where you fall on that transgender spectrum. But if you look at your body and you see a vagina and you identify as female, then that's called cisgender. If you look at your body and you see a vagina but you don't identify as female, that is called transgender. I um, That's a really wonderful explanation. And I think the word that uh, resonates with me the most uh, and what I'm continuing to think about is you said that it transcends. So it's the fact that we're uh, for uh, uh, the trans community, um, it's you're not stuck in one specific and you're not claiming to be one specific. Um, you know, for example, as a gay man, I identify as being male. Um, but with the trans community to kind of help explain it's, you're not set in that and it transcends the two traditional um, genders that we have. Um, so I really like that word. That's a really good word to use. Um, so how did um, coming out affect you? Uh, how did your whole uh, process start with coming out and how has it impacted your life? It's been a little crazy. So I had identified as non-binary for a long time, but it was the type of non-binary that was sort of easy to hide. Um, I didn't really take my pronouns seriously. I didn't really take any of it very seriously. I just sort of brushed it off as, oh, I don't care. They're all just words anyway. Um, and I just sort of carried through with that for a few years. So I never really had to come out in the traditional sense. But then I, you know, of course, we had a presidential election that didn't quite go the way I would have liked it to. And I felt the need to be a little bit more serious about my identity and about my pronouns because I knew that it was all going to matter uh, very, very intensely because we have people in positions of power who don't think that people like me should be considered human. Um, and I thought about a lot of the younger people, you know, the trans youth who are being, uh, whose parents who would once reject them are being empowered in their rejection. And 
from being empowered in their potential abuse even. And so thinking about those young kids who are just coming to terms with their identity and having to face all this potential blowback um, was what drove me to further analyze my identity. And the more I analyzed it, the more I realized, oh, the, you know, me not caring about my pronouns and me just, you know, saying I was non-binary on paper, but not really, you know, caring about it much was a defense mechanism. And it was a defense mechanism to disguise all of the dysphoria I was feeling in hopes that, oh, you know, if I ignore it and I pretend I don't care about it, it'll just go away. Um, so this, this all has a point, I promise. Um, so really, what ended up happening was I had to come out all over again. So it, even very, very recently, this has just been in the last couple of years, um, I had to come out to myself all over again. And that's really the first step uh, is, you know, coming to terms with like, okay, this is more than what I thought it was going to be. And that was probably the most painful part about the whole situation for me was coming out to myself and realizing, no, I'm not comfortable in my body. No, I, it, something isn't right. Uh, and, you know, trying to discover what, the, uncover what that really was. And, you know, I came out really for the second time when I announced my uh, top surgery, when I announced my masculinizing top surgery on Facebook. And I was very lucky in that I encountered nothing but love and support. And, you know, it was a beautiful thing to witness, to see so many people so open and so accepting of it and so curious about it. Because I, I want people to ask me questions. I want people to learn more about, you know, us transgender folks and what we deal with and what we go through. Um, now, a lot of my immediate family has passed on already, so I haven't really had to come out to anyone uh, other than my sister, and she was completely fine with it. Um, and the only other people I really had to come out to was my spouse. And thankfully, my spouse is one of those people where all he really ever wanted was for me to be happy. And he said, if this is going to make you happy, then go for it. So I've been very, very fortunate in that regard. Not everyone is as lucky as I am to have such a supportive network around them. Um, and, and that lingers in my mind a lot when I think about my coming out story as opposed to other people's. Yeah, I, you know, uh, personally, you know, for me, you know, I kind of have a same similar, you know, story where, you know, for the most part, you know, everything was very, everyone was so accepting and everyone was so welcoming and loving. Um, but that's not the general um, norm. That's not the general norm. Um, and especially like you said, having um, leaders who are actively trying to um, still take away our rights, rights that we have earned and are just, they're human rights. There's no question about it. We're all human. We should all have these basic human rights, but they're still trying to take that away. Um, so my next question for you would be, um, what kind of things might a person, um, who is an ally or someone who's interested in someone who wants to learn, um, how might them, uh, how might, what kinds of things should they do? What kind of things should they say, um, to someone who's in the LGBT community and maybe specifically the trans community, um, just to show their support, um, and to show that they're, um, uh, interested to learn more, um, because I know personally from you, um, me and hanging out with you for the past couple of weeks, um, you've taught me so much. Um, <laughs> so what could you share with the world and with the audience on how they can approach um, the trans community and anyone in the LGBT community on how to um, be better allies? So there's a lot of things you can do to be a better ally to the trans community specifically. One of the most important things, and I cannot stress this enough, that you can do to be an ally to anyone in the LGBTQ plus rainbow, especially trans people, is vote. <laughs> that is the, that's the biggest thing. And I've been asked, you know, by plenty of other people, how can I be a better ally? And the best way you can be a better ally is to vote and to vote you know, for people who will be supportive of the trans community and who humanize the trans community. Aside from that, um, be present 
you know, if you've got somebody who is wanting to talk to you about their gender identity or about struggles that they're having with that, then be present and be available for that. Because a lot of the time, you know, maybe one of your friends who's in the trans community might not have anyone to talk to, to share their struggles, to share their ideas, to share their excitement. I mean, for, you know, for me, when I first scheduled my top surgery and it was really happening and, you know, we were getting down to the wire, I was talking to mostly my trans friends about it because I knew they would be as excited about it as I was. But there's something so meaningful in just being present and being in the moment and saying, I'm here to listen. And when you're asking questions of someone in the trans community, you know, just sort of, I always tell people practice common sense, um, you know, kind of ask before you ask. So, because some people, their, their gender identity and their whole situation with that is rooted in a lot more trauma than mine is. Um, you know, I, I dealt with dysphoria, of course, I dealt with depression, but for some people it can be very, a very heavy topic. So before you ask them anything, basically ask them, do you have the emotional availability for me to ask you questions about this right now? And that gives them the power to say, sure, I can, I can answer questions about it, or, you know, maybe I'm not quite in the right headspace for that. Um, so leave room for them to step away if they need to, or to not talk about certain things. And a lot of it is common sense. Don't ask a trans person about our genitalia, please. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because for some people that can be a, a, a point of intense dysphoria and it can really trigger a lot of things in us. So some appropriate questions, uh, what are your preferred pronouns? Um, do you have a different name that you prefer to be called? Because I can tell you something, nothing gives a trans person more joy than being addressed by their chosen name. And and that's what, a, what I do with a lot of the young trans people who I interact with uh, is first and foremost, I tell them, you know, what name do you want me to call you? And then they'll say it and then I'll say it over and over and over again. And you can just see the light coming to their face when you use their chosen identity. Um, if you do slip up, you know, correct yourself quickly and efficiently. Don't make a big deal out of it. We understand it happens. Um, but yeah, I would say you know, don't get too personal with questions a lot of the time. Really focus it on what that person's goals are. You know, say, what name do you want me to call you? Do you prefer he, she, they, what's going on? You know, like, get that background information. And then if they want to talk more deeply about their goals for their transition, allow them to, you know, you know, leave yourself open for that conversation. But you know, try not to push it too far because sometimes there can be some psychological trauma associated with that. Yeah, because I mean, that's, you know, especially for every person, you know, there are times where um, we just don't want to talk about it. You know, I know personally, you know, uh, there are things that people bring up and I'm like, I just don't want to talk about it. Um, so I appreciate that. And it's just treating, you know, it's just treating everyone like they want to be treated. Um, and just treating people like with people, people uh, just treating yourself and others with love and with respect. Um, I like that. Um, and you know, I, you've brought it up a few times. Um, and this is something that I have been a part of your journey. I've been able to see and be present in your journey and through your, um, uh, you have to remind me, uh, your surgery that you just had, would you be okay with explaining that a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I'm an open book and my goal is and has always been to educate people about trans issues. Uh, and one of the things that can be part of someone's transition is surgery. So one thing that I really want people to understand is transition is so incredibly individual and it's so incredibly personal to each individual trans person. Some trans people will go their entire lives without ever having surgery, without ever doing hormone replacement therapy, without ever doing any of it. They are still just as valid as trans individuals as anybody else. Um, but regarding transitioning, there's a lot of different things that people can do uh, to transition, one of those things being surgery. So 
and depending on what your transition goals are for yourself, there's a few different surgeries that can take place. Medical science has come a long, long way uh, in terms of, you know, having different surgical techniques and different things that you can do. Um, so what I had is what we call top surgery, which means that my chest was masculinized. So most of my breast tissue was removed and then my nipples were removed and regrafted into a more masculine location on my torso. Um, so that's a very common surgery among trans men and among uh, some non-binary individuals as well, um, just to slightly masculinize the upper silhouette. Um, of course, with male to female uh, transitions, you have, they have a top surgery too. Um, so with uh, someone who was assigned male at birth who wants to feminize their features or feminize their chest, or even a non-binary person who wants to feminize their chest, there is a top surgery for that as well. You can have facial feminization or masculinization procedures, um, you know, in men typically, or in people assigned male at birth, I should say. Typically that would be softening the jawline, for example, uh, you know, filling the lips or the cheeks to give a more feminine silhouette. silhouette. Um, then you also have, of course, bottom surgeries, um, which are, you know, reorganizing things in the basement, so to speak. But what I think is important to note is a lot of the time bottom surgeries are very risky um, and they can be more prone to complications. So most trans friends of mine have not undergone by, uh, bottom surgery and will never undergo bottom surgery. Uh, I know it's not a part of my transition personally, but it is an option. It is out there uh, and you know, any trans person who is thinking about going in that direction uh, surgically, I would highly encourage them to do their research uh, and find surgeons that specialize in transgender care. Because if you're just going to a regular plastic surgeon who's never done this before, it could create some issues. <laughs> yeah, and especially, you know, um, you know, you said it yourself, you know, science has come so far. Um, we have these uh, wonderful television programs, which I'm very appreciative, appreciated, appreciative of, um, to be able to give a glimpse into that. Um, so I want to thank you for clarifying um, and giving a little bit more specific details because again, it is different for um, trans masculine and the trans feminine. There is a difference. Um, mm -hmm. And I never realized that um, the bottom surgery was actually more complicated. You know, I kind of figured there was some difficulty there because there are some major differences. Um, but I never realized it was that complicated. I always thought that. Um, whenever someone was go, was transitioning, that always occurred. Bottom surgery always occurred. Um, so again, thank you for clarifying that because it, that's not the case. Um, yeah, bottom surgery can be, you know, extremely risky and a lot of people opt not to do that. Um, just because, I mean, I know for um, a lot of the like, I forget what the medical term is for it, but for the, M to F uh, bottom surgeries, you're hospitalized for seven to 10 days, you're catheterized, there's all kinds of different complicated stuff going on uh, when you're dealing with the plumbing. But, you know, one of the things that kind of annoys me most uh, about living as a trans person is, you know, with some cis individuals, not everyone, but with some cis individuals, one of the first things out of their mouth is, so are you getting the bottom surgery? Like, you know, I, I had someone ask me that, you know, when I first came out about my top surgery, they were like, so are you going to get a dick now? And I was like, Ugh. <laughs> it's, it's very individual transitioning is transitioning is very individual. Some people get surgery, but they don't go on hormone replacement therapy. Some people go on hormones and never get surgery. It's such an individual thing and it can be a very personal and very private thing. So it's one of those things that, you know, obviously be open to your trans person talking about their surgical, you know, their surgical future or their hormone future with you, but be okay with it if they don't want to talk about that, because really that's kind of a thing between them and their doctor. Yeah. And again, that's extremely personal. Um, I'm trying to see, 
you keep reminding me of this clip that I saw and I'm pulling out my phone so I can try to find it. And it speaks perfectly to what you just said about how uncomfortable it was. Um, and the clip, and you might be able to know that, um, you might know this um, or be uh, knowledgeable of this um, interview. It's with Laverne Cox. Oh, um, I love her. <laughs> of Laverne Cox. And she was, uh, for some reason, it was, um, I want to say it was Katie Couric. Mm. But I don't think it was Katie Couric. Um, but interview, let's see if this pops up. Um, but it was so awkward <laughs> to hear this interview. It's, uh, I'm so yeah. horrible at, um, but and that's what I usually tell trans youth. Like, you know, a lot of people want to know what coming out is like. And I say, well, you will never have more people ask you about your genitalia than when you come out as trans. <laughs> yeah, and so just be prepared for cis people to ask you all kind of questions about your body. <laughs> yeah, and I just, you know, I you think about that and it just makes me cringe because you wouldn't ask you wouldn't ask any person that you wouldn't ask any person that, but for some reason we think it's okay to go, Hey, what's going on? Um, yeah. Things and, have gotten better, you know, in, in modern times, thankfully, uh, it used to be a lot worse than it is. Uh, thankfully now that more education is getting out there and more trans people are in the public spotlight, it, it's becoming a lot, better you know people are like okay maybe i shouldn't ask that person about the current status of the genitalia you know <laughs> maybe that's yeah. not such a good idea um so this kind of follows up to another question that i have is um what other um uh stereotypes or what other you know moments that you get as a non-binary trans person um that you just absolutely hate and you wish, um, you know, these moments, you, if you can just share with us right now, be like, just don't do this because it just makes me cringe. It just makes me upset and it violates my privacy. You know, what moments like that do you have? So talking about a trans person's genitalia is a big one. Um, my, I guess hate's a strong word, but my big thing is if someone gives you their preferred pronouns, respect them. Like it, you know, I've, I've had most of my interactions with people have been very, very positive. You know, if I say I prefer they, them pronouns, they're like, perfect, amazing, awesome. And if they mess up, they fix it. And that's fine. Um, but there have been some people, of course, I live in a very conservative area. So there've been some people who were like, they, them isn't grammatically correct. You know, I'm not going to use that because they, them isn't grammatically correct. And the truth of the matter is the singular they has been in use since the 1500s. So try again, Carol. But um, that's a big thing. Just there's a lot of invalidation that goes on uh, with, you know, cis people toward trans people. Um, there's a lot of, it happens a lot more to trans women than it does to me uh, as a non-binary person. But, you know, just stuff like, you'll never be a real man or you'll never be a real woman. Um, a lot of my trans woman uh, colleagues have had those sorts of interactions where people will say, you'll never be a real woman because you can't give birth because you can't have children um, or you'll never be a real man because you don't have a penis or you'll like, whatever. Some of the most beautiful men I know don't have penises, but it's a lot of it is insensitivity. And that's part of what makes me so passionate about educating people about what it means to be a trans person and, you know, how to better interact around trans people, because that can cause a lot of pain and it can cause a lot of generational trauma uh, among trans folks. From a non-binary perspective, I've also, um, the, the biggest thing that annoys me is people assuming that I am somehow unsure uh, or like uncertain of my identity, or I'm just like trying to be able to dance in the middle or, um, you know, uh, when I tell people I'm non-binary, they're like, okay, but which side do you want to be? And it's like, no, that's not how it works, <laughs> fam. I don't want to be either, ideally. We're going for full ambiguity. 
Um, but, you know, a lot of people are so stuck because our society has trapped us into this binary gender system where everything is either pink or blue, male or female. And we've got to transcend that duality. We've got to transcend that binary because not everything is black or white or male or female or anything like that. And you, when you only trap yourself in those things, you deny the beautiful complexity that exists in human, in the human mind and in human gender expression. You know, people like friends of mine saying, oh, I would love to like assigned male at birth friends of mine saying, oh, I would love to, you know, be able to wear a skirt or a dress and let my bits flap in the breeze. And I say, why don't you? <laughs> like, who cares? Um, so it's just like um, the, the big annoying part of it for me is people who refuse to adapt to the changing times and refuse to acknowledge the humanity of trans and non-binary people. You know, non-binary people aren't just looking for attention. I've heard that a lot too, where it's like, oh, you're not actually a part of the trans community. You're just saying you're non-binary because you want attention, you want to feel special. And it's like, well, no, not quite. <laughs> so a lot of it is a dehumanization of people in our end of the LGBTQ plus rainbow, you know, we're humans, we're people, we are not sick, we are not crazy, there is nothing wrong with us. We are just trying to live the most authentic version of ourselves that we possibly can. And sometimes, yeah, we need other people's help to do that. Yeah, I, um, because one thing I want to touch on really quick, and uh, you kind of brought it up, and we don't need to dive deep into it, um, it's because there are, you know, underneath the, the queer LGBTQ rainbow, um, you have some more specific communities, like you have non-binary, um, which is, um, again, you're saying uh, you're transcending all of the genders and you're, you, you're not identifying with um, a specific one, where you have other ones like gender fluid, where it's your kind of you can sway back and forth. Whereas like today I feel more feminine and today I feel more masculine. Um, and they kind of, and they are also able to go down in the non-binary sense as well. It's like, you know what, I just feel me today. Um, yeah. So I think that's important is that there are still differences. Um, and it's not, and again, it's highlighting the fact that you're not trying to do this for attention. It's what makes you me feel the most authentic. Um, and that's what we're all trying to go for. Um, there was something else I was, I can't remember, but there was something else that you mentioned. Um, but, oh, it was um, the being, just being sensitive and just being present. Um, you know, there are people out there who are still trapped in these um, old mind frames of gender identity. And, you know, if you wear a dress, you're a female. Um, I'm not gonna say their names, but I have friends who, um, they're, they have kids and they allow their kids to wear whatever they want. Um, it's not specifically to say, oh, my kids are boys, but I'm trying to force them to wear dresses so they can be gay. And that's, you know, they had, they posted a picture in a video of their young boys. Um, they wanted to wear dresses. There was no harm in it, but they all of a sudden just got attacked. Because all these people who um, couldn't understand, they thought they were trying to force their kids to be something. And it's like, that's not, you know, boys can like pink, girls can like blue, girls can um, be bossy, and girls can get shit done, and men can be sensitive. Um, so I appreciate you acknowledge you just saying that and that. Uh, I think that's something that we all can learn from the trans community and non-binary community is um, just learning to love yourself. Um, this is going back to what you said earlier, especially in these, in these times with these leaders that we have, um, you know, I personally was kind of like you where I kind of was like, you know, I'm here, I'm queer, you know, I'm just going to live my life. But now, um, you know, with, uh, you know, talking to you and hanging out with you over the past couple of weeks 
and with everything going on with um the black uh, with the black lives movement with the trans movement because there are so many black trans women who just for being themselves are getting murdered um yeah. i felt i don't know how you felt and you can talk about that i that was when i felt the need to go you know what i'm happy and i live in an environment where i feel loved but i that that gives me the voice and the platform to be able to share my story and you know with this whole show it's to share everyone's story everyone needs a platform um and that's thoughts? exactly it i mean it breaks my heart when i you know when i was doing my when i was doing my number which i believe we'll see later on or maybe we've already seen <laughs> um when i was putting my number together i was doing some research um about black trans lives and you know looking up some names and just seeing the hundreds and hundreds of black trans women that have been murdered for no crime other than living authentically and for me as someone who is both white and in a secure emotionally supportive environment it's more important than ever for me to be incredibly vocal about my identity as a trans person because I have the privilege of safety and not many people can say that. There are some people out there, you know, even on TikTok where I create content, there are people who can't come out, you know, who it's not safe to come out. And really, you know, I mean, there are some moments where any LGBTQ plus person doesn't feel safe coming out, but especially when you're trans, there's still a lot of hostility toward trans people because people aren't ready to break out of that safe little bubble of pink and blue and male and female and that safe little binary bubble where everything is predictable and wonderful and all you have to do is look at someone's crotch to be able to tell who they are and people don't want i think you know people don't want change especially in the older generations people don't want to be confronted with the idea that you may have to work a little harder to get to know someone uh, instead of for just looking at what they're wearing and immediately being able to, you know, pass judgment on who they are or learn about who they are, um, which I guess is why I aim for ambiguity always, because I kind of want to make people uncomfortable. <laughs> Not, you know, my trans siblings, obviously, but I want to be that person that makes these transphobic people uncomfortable, that makes these transphobic people question everything that's been going on because you know if i can give with if with my radical act of authenticity if i can give one trans kid the courage to put that blush on for the first time or if i can give that one trans kid the courage to talk to their family about top surgery if i can give that one trans kid the courage to say hey you know what i'm going to wear whatever matches me today and that's perfectly fine then my life will have had purpose and if i can you know if with the education and the volume at which i talk about these subjects i can dispel the fears that people have for trans people and trans issues and i can bring you know even a handful of those people out of the transphobic proverbial closet and bring them into a place of support and help and tolerance and if i can prevent even one trans person from being murdered for who they are then that gives my life meaning and i'm willing to shout as loudly as possible from as many rooftops as i can climb to to make that happen well i will be right there with you shouting from those rooftops because i think it's um now more than ever um and it's always been an issue as is we just need to allow everyone in our community um, to be seen and to be heard. Um, so I'm going to ask you, it's kind of like a double up question. So the first part of the question is, what can people do to make um, you feel seen as a trans person, as a non-binary person? Um, and then you kind of answered it before, but I want to go circle back to um, why? Why should we be interested in these issues? So in, in terms of making, allowing trans people to feel seen, pronouns are a big part of that. 
um, you know, people act like pronouns aren't a big deal. And for some people, they aren't a big deal. But for many, many members of the trans community, they are. So if someone, the best thing you can do to make someone feel seen if, if, is if a trans person has given you a name to, to call them by, if they have given you pronouns to call them by because you've asked for them, like the wonderful ally you are, when you get those things, use them. Use them as often as humanly possible. Because I remember the first time that my spouse, who has known me long, long before my transition ever really came into frame, um, you know, I remember the first time he used gender neutral pronouns with me. And I remember the first time he called me by my preferred name and just the rush of love and support and validation that comes with that because that's what a lot of trans people are looking for they're looking for validation they're looking for other people to look at them and say yes i see you you are who you say you are you are valid you are worthy and it's the simplest things that can really change the game for somebody um like that you know telling a trans man that they look handsome as fuck that day like it's it's the little things um i'm sorry that just got to me because uh, you know it's there's wow um you know it's those little things um that we we usually take for granted um mm-hmm. that's powerful it's just and that's a wonderful way to oh wow that is that is really touched me i'm sorry i totally interrupted you but that's that's powerful that's powerful stuff it can Um, mean everything it can mean everything to a trans person to you know i remember there was a a friend of mine who was having a bit of a dysphoric episode they were they were having a bit of a crisis um because they had just spoken to one of their family members who was very very heavily transphobic and i just took their face in my hands and i said their their chosen name over and over and over again and that is enough sometimes to bring someone back from the brink because for many of us trans people you know our transition our transformation the use of our pronouns the use of our chosen name the you know the surgeries or the hormones or anything that we do to live more authentically as ourselves, these are life-saving. You know, when you think about the high rate of suicide among trans people, because either they don't feel safe coming out or they don't, you know, they've got all of this awful dysphoria in their heads that they're living with every day. And I tell my friends all the time when they ask me, what does dysphoria feel like? It feels like wearing an extremely ill-fitting pair of shoes except you can't take them off, <laughs> you know? So that would suck. It's, every, it's every time you look in the mirror, feeling that wrongness, feeling that, ah, uh, like that ill-fitting pain. And it's just nagging and constant. And for some people, the pain becomes too much. And even as I'm recovering from this top surgery, all I can think about is all of the other people I know who, for whom surgery is an eventual goal, but who can't, quite get there yet for one reason or another you know maybe it's a monetary thing a lot of insurance companies still don't cover gender affirmation procedures um maybe it's like a a familial acceptance thing whatever reason um there's many people in my life who want to get top surgery and who can't for one reason or another so it's like yes i feel all of this beautiful gender euphoria uh from this procedure but then at the same time there's still that little tinge of guilt of like there's still so many people that don't have this yet. And I remember when I first started feeling trans euphoria after the, we, we call it gender euphoria, where you're feeling more yourself and you just have this beautiful, um, you know, almost high from being able to be more authentically you. And it's the same thing that happens when someone uses our chosen pronouns or when someone uses our chosen name. That's gender euphoria, that smile that comes across your trans person's face. And when I started feeling that, um, I had a little moment last night where I was looking down at myself and just smiling. And I was just like, I, I want to give every trans person that I know this same feeling all the time because I know how heavy and how painful dysphoria can be. And I just, I just want to fix it for everybody. Yeah. Um, 
I remember, um, you know, talking about your experience, you know, you shared on Facebook and you shared with us um, that moment where, and if it's okay that I can share this, um, you shared yeah, with uh, um, when you, cause you flew to Miami, um, mm -hmm. you went to Miami um, and they kept referencing you as she, her. Um, and then when you came back and you were leaving the airport and I, that difference, um, how did that make you feel? It must've been the same, the same thing you were just talking about. Gender euphoria. It was one of the first moments where I really felt validated and where I really felt recognized for my chosen identity. And I mean, like, you know, coming into the Miami airport and being called ma'am, 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 over and over and over again, every time somebody uses a pronoun like that, they are knowingly or unknowingly adding to that dysphoria. And that was part of the reason why I wanted top surgery so badly is because my chest was a visible, painful reminder of my femaleness. And people could look at me and immediately say, female, I'm going to call you by these pronouns. I'm going to call you by this name. I'm going to call you by these suffixes and you can't do anything about it. And, you know, of course, a lot of us are a little bit too bashful or maybe even afraid to correct people on it because it's like, you know, I, I never used to correct people on my pronouns because you never know what's going to happen. I mean, somebody could get super defensive and you could end up as a statistic or a newspaper article. So definitely didn't want to have that happen. But then I went back to the Miami airport after the surgery and it was sir, sir, sir. And the, I didn't think it would affect me as much as it did, but I sat at the gate to my plane and I had to stop myself from crying because it was just such an affirming, validating thing that all of this pain and all of this discomfort and all of this struggle that I've been going through for years of my life now, not just the physical struggle of recovering from surgery, but the psychological struggle of the dysphoria I felt for decades was starting to lift and it was all starting to be worth it because I was getting to a place where I could help other people to come to that same comfort with themselves. And that's all I want in the whole wide world. I want every single trans person who is watching this interview right now to know that they are valid, that they are worthy, that their transition is theirs and theirs alone, and that you know nobody else has any bearing on who you are. And I want you to know that gender euphoria and that comfort and that feeling at home in your skin is possible and that you will get there. That's, uh, that was beautiful. Um, so good. This is going to go back to my second question is, um, why, why should, um, uh, we be interested in these issues that are facing, um, the LGBTQ, um, queer plus community? Well, Sean, we should, you know, people should care about the issues facing the LGBTQ plus community because there's a lot of us. <laughs> we are your, you know, we are your movie stars. We are your makeup artists. We are your hairdressers. We are your clothing stylists. We are your designers. The queer community is what brings color and vibrancy and joy into the universe. I mean, when you think about how many artists there are that are queer, how many, you know, people are starting to come into the mainstream as part of the rainbow in some way, whether it be, you know, uh, Miley Cyrus, who's pansexual, or, you know, uh, Laverne Cox, who is the most gorgeous trans woman, oh my god. Um, all of you there we're everywhere and we're not going anywhere and if anything you know now that well eventually when it becomes a little bit safer uh for queer people to start coming out of the closet you're going to see a lot more of us and i think people will come to realize with time that even themselves even people who thought that they were straight or they were cis are going to realize that maybe they're not so rigid you know, maybe they're not as straight as they thought they were. Maybe they're not as cisgender as they thought they were. You know, uh, a lot of one of the things that has started happening since I got my top surgery is I've started getting questions from people, people who are looking to explore 
their gender expression, people who are looking to teach their children to explore their gender expression, people who are encouraging creativity in themselves. You know, I have people messaging me asking questions about binders, which are, uh, you know, a garment that you can use to compress your chest down when you haven't had top surgery or don't want to have top surgery. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. We are everywhere and we're not going anywhere. So you might as well treat us with the common decency and respect that you do any other human being. Reach. And we're in trouble, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, especially we're... right now with Donald Trump being the president, we are in trouble. And, you... and yeah, I mean, that's it's just so important for people to, you know, because your friend, your family member, your brother, your sister, your spouse might come out to you as non-binary someday or might come out to you as trans someday. And I don't want anyone else to lose a family member because that family member or that friend or that loved one felt scared to be themselves authentically around that person. I don't want any more trans people to be murdered. I don't want any more, you know, LGBTQ plus people to be rejected by their families and to be driven to suicide or to be driven to some other tragic end. You know, we, you know a lot more LGBTQ people than you realize. And I'd hate for you to lose those people. Yeah, and you know, there, there's definitely this, um, especially over just the past couple of years, um, there's just been this influx of um, uh, uh, pop culture where we're seeing more people being represented and more of um, the LGBTQ plus community, more of the black, people of color, uh, uh, the majority of the world, um, we're seeing more representation and I think that matters. Um, so my next question to you is, can you remember when you actually saw yourself represented in pop culture, media, um, if it's on TV, a movie, if it was a musical artist, um, do you have a moment like that? I don't really. I mean, I, I haven't, I don't really watch movies that much, um, and I don't really watch fiction television that much, so admittedly, I don't have a big frame of reference to pull from, uh, and, you know, non-binary people have sort of been in the wings of the universe for a long time. Um, I do remember seeing, uh, you know, seeing a, you know, a non-binary person or a, a drag king in the mainstream for the first time, and it was it was very validating, even seeing trans women in, you know, out in the universe and out in the mainstream like Laverne Cox, seeing those trans women out there being successful in their fields, being respected in their fields, and just living out loud is such a beautiful validating thing because it's like, yeah, you know, I want these trans kids to be able to see themselves up on a movie screen or see themselves on TikTok or see themselves, you know, doing whatever thing they want to do. And that, you know, that kind of visibility matters because it makes you feel not so otherized. You know, it, for a long time, you, you know, when you're trans, you will feel alienated. You will feel other. You will feel kind of like the odd one out. And, you know, that kind of visibility, having high profile figures of any gender identity or expression is huge. It goes a long way toward validating those younger people. Yeah, and uh, you know, I remember, I, you know, and I think that goes kind of beyond, um, you know, specifically the trans community. You know, I remember um, when my experiences, I was a little, I remember when Ellen came out on her show, um, but I know personally for me, it was when Will and Grace, Oh, Pop, Will and Grace, <laughs> you know, and that's why it's forever one of my favorite TV shows, um, mm -hmm. because that was really the first time that I was able to see myself in a context where I didn't feel so alone. Um, and I, you said it perfectly. It's it's the visibility, is to be able to see yourself and to be able to see. You know what? If um, Laverne Cox, if all these stars who are just like me, if they could be on the TV screen, if they can make a pop album, if 
um, a pansexual like Miley Cyrus can still have a successful music career, it's very validating and it allows us to be visible. Um, mm -hmm. And I love the fact that uh, um, I've seen some wonderful things specifically on the trans community that I would um, uh, express, uh, share with anyone who's watching. I would 100% finish watching the show, schedule time to watch uh, Disclosure is on Netflix. Um, that was so eye-opening, um, learning um, from and hearing it from the mouths and from the bodies of trans uh, masculine and trans feminine um, people um, that we've been here, that they, not we, you, you uh, that community has been here. Um, mm -hmm. Disclosure is one. Um, I saw one with uh, one of my co-founders, uh, Gary, who you all have met earlier. Um, the Life and Death of Marsha P. Johnson, um, mm -hmm. which we are doing an educational segment um, about that. Um, but, and you mentioned this earlier, uh, this is probably one of the things I'm going to remember, um, is that documentary, it's on Netflix, The, Light, the Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson, um, was so eye-opening for me. I knew those legends, um, uh, uh, Marsha P., Sylvie, Stormy, but specifically Marsha and Sylvie, I knew they were there. I knew they had a part. Um, mm -hmm. And they are both people of color, trans. Um, and I remember that moment in the life and death, a death and life of Marsha P. Johnson, where Sylvie got on stage at um, one, it was a, a, a pride rally a little further on after Stonewall. And they had pushed all the trans, all the drag queens to the back. They moved them all the way to the back. So they weren't even a part of the parade, a part of the march. They had pushed the, the people who fought for us to have a pride all the way in the back. And I'm getting chills now just thinking about it. And I was just like, I, I, I was just dumbfounded. Um, which is why I think, and you mentioned this, visibility matters. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe that's why people should care about LGBTQ plus issues, because I feel like pride has been very commercialized in recent years. There's a lot of people who, uh, you know, they, they go to Target and they buy their rainbow clad crop top and they go to the pride parades and they see the drag queens and they drink themselves stupid. And it's like, you know, it, it's almost become another just party for them. And what I always try to remind people of is if it weren't for the trans community, you would not have a pride parade. So yeah. and, and even remember us, you know? Yeah, you know, and that's exactly it, you know, and this and that was one of the reasons why um, I know Gary, Kenny and I wanted to do this was I remember it was, I didn't even see it because I knew it was just a travesty that the, they made a movie Stonewall mm -hmm. um, where I think that was the name of it. I don't even know, but they whitewashed the hell out of it. Um, it was people of color, the world majority, and it was trans dra and drag kings um, who started that riot on Stonewall that night and no one really gives them credit. And again, uh, you know, that one documentary kept hitting that nail on the head, just kept hitting it. And mm -hmm. you said earlier, um, and we talked about this, how the black trans community, how the trans community, they're seeing all these deaths, these murders. Um, Marsha P. Johnson, um, oh, I can't, I can't spoil it for you. You have to watch that documentary. Um, I need to. I yeah, you need to watch it because it's it just highlights so much about everything you're talking about, and um, it's been a problem. And it's you know when the trans community is the one are the ones that really and trans POC especially were the ones that really started Pride, and you see all these people dancing with glitter all over their face and rainbows all over their body, and it's a beautiful thing. But at the same time, it's like, okay, but trans, you know, black trans women are still being murdered. Trans people the world over are still being murdered and discriminated against. And 
you know, they're still having to fight to be humanized. And that's what pride is about. Pride is about having a safe place to be authentically yourself. And pride is about bringing attention to issues that still plague the LGBTQ community. This fight is not over, not by a long shot. We still have a long way to go before we can be equal, before we can be safe. And that's all we really want. I mean, it's like, I know, you know, people, people are like, we got to give the trans community credit. And it's like, yes, we want credit. We would also like to stop being murdered. <laughs> yeah. So let's start there. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, we have, we live in a political climate where we have people who are so actively trying to take away our rights, but more specifically trans uh, access to healthcare, um, you know, the LGBT community for adoption, for education, for um, uh, 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 discrimination in the workplace. Um, there's just so much that we still have to fight for and we still have to, um, you know, uh, be active about and support each other. Um, Cause I know when I was first meeting with all of you and all the other performers and talking to you all about being a part of this, um, one of the things that still resonates with me and why I'm so proud of um, We Three Queens in this show um, and all of, you, all of you, I spoke to six of you that day. Um, you were, and, and there, all of you said that your communities and everyone that you kind of, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm not quoting anyone, but pretty much you all said that in your world, people think of being gay as being white and being male. And that's only just like this, it's this much of the rainbow. It's not even a full color. Barely and, scratching the surface. <laughs> yeah, there are so many beautiful, authentic individuals who deserve to live a beautiful life, a life without fear, a life without hate, a life without um, the anxiety of walking down the street going, am I gonna get murdered? Um, you know, I had, I had experience over at, um, uh, one of the local, um, gathering places that I go to with one of my good friends. Um, I'm very well known there. Um, but you, we had a couple there were a couple people in there who were throwing, they were saying the word faggot and they were mm -hmm. saying it directly towards me. Um, and you know, because of, I will say because of this project and Finn, because of, you know, I was specifically thinking of you, um, I made sure I, you, you, you talked about how you didn't, you didn't, you, you don't know how to react to situations like that because you don't know how people are going to react. Um, but knowing from my place of privilege, um, cause I do have some, um, I, was not silent and I was thinking of you Finn and thinking of all the other people out there who didn't have a voice and I was like excuse me sir excuse <laughs> me. um <clears throat> and I made it and I made it known that that was not okay um yeah so and I mean that's a way that you can be a good ally too I mean obviously don't put your trans fam at risk but you know just being present and being there for them, even whether that means confronting people or whether that means just taking them to a place where they can feel a little bit safer. Uh, I've said it once and I've said it a thousand thousand times until my trans sisters of color can feel safe walking the streets alone, pride will never be a victory party for me. It will always be a battle cry. And that's part of what galvanizes me to keep going and keep speaking out because like we've said in this interview already i come from a place of privilege as a white person as you know someone who grew up in a very accepting welcoming stable environment as someone who is surrounded by supportive people not everyone has what i have and when you have that ability to be able to protect someone who has less than you or to be able to supply someone and fill someone who has less than you why wouldn't you i mean it it just makes sense to me so 
I have a lot of validation from the people in my life. And so if I can validate other people around me who maybe don't have that, it's something that's very, very easy uh, to do. And it's something that's very easy for straight cis people to do too. And it's those little steps. It's those little things, you know, walking your trans friend to their car at the end of the night, you know, I, addressing, you know, correcting someone when they misgender your trans friend, you know, it doesn't necessarily like just taking that emotional burden off of the trans person. And, and, you know, it doesn't have to be a big thing. You know, if somebody says, oh, hey, uh, you know, I feel, oh yeah, I feel like I've met her before. It's like, oh yeah, I introduced them to you last week. So it's just like th something simple like that. It doesn't have to be like, hey, now. It's been like, no, um, you can be very simple about it. Now, obviously, if someone's doing it maliciously, then go hard in the paint, do what you gotta do. But safety first, always, whether you are a trans person or you are an ally. Um, you know, I would love to live in a moment where trans people can live their authentic selves safely and openly, but the fact of the matter is, that's not always the case. So if I can take the baby steps to help validate that person in the sphere that they're in with me, then maybe that'll make the moments where they have to be dead named because it's not safe to come out or they have to be misgendered because it's not safe to come out that little bit easier to bear. Um, so that would, that's a great segue to, I think it might be one of my last questions is um, where do you, you see or where would you like to see um the lgbtq plus community in the future like five years from now um what uh changes do you hope w would have happened um what um yeah i think that's kind of it yeah what changes do you hope to, to see happening over the next couple of years oh uh you know more than just acceptance because a lot of people i think for a long time were settling for acceptance and I would love to see more than just acceptance. I would love to see embracing. I would love to see people embracing their trans siblings and their non-binary siblings. I would love to see, you know, insurance companies covering portions of gender affirmation treatments, whether it be surgeries, hormone therapies, that kind of thing, because that's still a thing that doesn't happen in some cases. Or if it does happen, there's all kind of hoops you have to jump through in order for it to happen. Um, you know, people recognizing the complexity of transition and the individuality of transition, you know, recognizing that a trans woman who doesn't have bottom surgery ever is still a trans woman, you know, <laughs> trans women are women, trans men are men, non-binary people are valid. And, you know, really the ultimate goal for me is for trans people to be treated just like everybody else. We don't want any special treatment. We just want to be able to live comfortably in our skin, to be authentically ourselves, and to be respected and valued as members of the global community. That's what I hope. Anyway, what yeah. is actually going to happen is going to largely depend on elections. So yes. vote, motherfuckers! <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think, yeah, I think, yeah, I agree. Um, vote 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 in because it's august september october november it's like 80 days away um go vote um you know i in my community um i do uh, have some trump supporters and i don't want to call them out specifically because not all trump supporters feel and have a hatred towards us but what I would like to personally, and maybe you can uh, join me on this fan or maybe uh, your thoughts is, you know, the, there are people out there who are still trying to take our rights away. And mm -hmm. it's about knowledge and doing your research. Um, you know, the fact that um, you are trans, the fact that you are non-binary, the fact that you are a uh, world of the uh, uh, majority of the world, uh, the fact that you are gay or a lesbian shouldn't be a part of politics. You know, we're, it's human. We're all human. And the fact that there are people making that a political 
issue is the issue. Yeah, it is. And I mean, for, for Trump supporters, I understand that there are some people who have voted for Trump and who don't hate LGBTQ plus people, but the fact remains, you know, the fact that your candidate hates LGBTQ plus people wasn't a deal breaker for you. And so for me, I almost stopped being nice about that kind of stuff because at this point, you know, uh, uh, the current president has shown us his entire ass. He's shown us exactly who he is and exactly how he feels about this particular rainbow of people. And so for me anymore, anybody who is willingly still voting for Trump is committing an act of violence against the trans community because this is a man who doesn't want who doesn't want our humanity to be legally recognized and he said as much so i really encourage people to think when they're voting and to think about their trans siblings and to think about their their queer family and to think about all of the people in their lives and all of the beautiful things in their lives that happened as a result of queer people and of people of color and of so many others. And I'm not gonna tell anyone who to vote for, it's not my place, but I encourage people to vote like their lives depended on it because for some of us, it does. It does. Um, and you know, it's funny, it's interesting um, what you said before we got on that little a uh, bit of a conversation is, um, and I would love for you to repeat it, is how the trans community, you all just, everyone, and it's everyone, you just want to be seen, you just want to be validated. Um, can you, I would, I would love for you just to repeat that again. All the trans community is asking for is humanity. That's it. We just want to be recognized and validated and seen as the human beings that we are. Simple as that. Finn, I want to thank you very much um, for meeting with me and for um, giving your time to, for me to interview you and ask these questions. Um, just like you, I hope um, this interview, if it's your interview, if it's with another interview, um, it can help um shed some light on trans issues and on lgbtq issues um definitely but like i would like to give you a last moment to um say any last thoughts that you have uh well it, this is a beautiful thing um that we're all doing i think and i feel honored to have been given the space to speak um but i think more than anything like I've said in this interview already numerous times, uh, it's important to get the message out there that if you are or think you might be a member of the trans community, if you know, no matter where in that adventure of discovery you are, whether you're first starting to kind of question all of those gender norms that were pushed on you from birth, or whether you are fully and completely in the midst of your transition process, you are human, you are seen, you are valued, and we're happy you're here. At least I am. I honestly, truly would not be here today, sitting before you, being as comfortable with myself and my identity as I am, without my trans siblings. And they are the real MVPs, <laughs> you know, we go through a lot and it can be extremely difficult uh, to live your life as a trans person, but it is so worth it to get to the point where you feel at home in your body and you deserve that. Every single one of you deserves that. Thank you so much, Finn. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Um, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.